the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail welcomes you. Join with Senior Pastor Dr. Mike Whitson as we present Decision for Life. Welcome to First Baptist Church Indian Trail. Uh, really felt led to do a very special, maybe four or five week study uh, on the privileges that we have as believers. The privileges that we have as believers. So I want to be talking in the next few weeks about the privilege of salvation, the privilege of eternal security, the privilege of prayer, the privilege of the Holy Spirit. And then I want to finish up uh, on the privilege of the blessed hope. Now you don't want to miss any of those weeks, but especially you want to be here for that blessed hope. Um, years ago, um, let's see, how long has it been now? About 20 years ago, uh, my son and his family were commissioned to the International Mission Board. And uh, Kathy and I were just at, uh, we, we were really trying to figure out how are we going to be able to see them? They're going to be halfway across the world. And uh, so we did something, I don't recommend this, but we bought a timeshare. Okay? And uh, we thought that timeshare, well, we could link up uh, someplace that they could come to and we could go to and it would still be kind of like a vacation. And so we bought that timeshare in order for them, for us to be able and really would force us uh, to, no, don't take that wrong, but force us uh, to, to be together at least once a year. Now, years later, um, I got to reading the fine print. But now, wait a minute, before you jump to conclusions, I found out a whole bunch of stuff that I was privileged with that I was not aware of, that things that I could take advantage of that I did not know was at my disposal. Now, I've, I've been a Christian since 1970, and I've been, I've been pastoring a church uh, since 1976. And here's what I've noticed about believers. I've noticed they get saved, okay? Receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and as their Savior. And uh, then about 15 years later, it's like somebody flips the switch and a light bulb comes on and all of a sudden they become keenly aware of their privileges that came with their salvation. And so these next few weeks, you know, I, I know some of this is going to be elementary, but to many it's going to be eye-opening and refreshing and renewing. I want to talk about some of those privileges. And today I want to talk to you about the privilege of salvation. Take your Bible and look with me to Isaiah chapter number 12, and I want you to see verse 2. Isaiah chapter number 12, and we're only going to look at verse number 2. Would you stand with me uh, as we read verse 2 together? Isaiah chapter 12 and verse 2. It's on page 616. All right. That's my Bible. No, no, no. Don't do that in yours. It's good to hear those pages turn. Verse 2. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also is become my salvation. Let's bow together in prayer. Father, thank you for everyone that has come here today to hear your word. I pray that your Holy Spirit would brand this word in our hearts so that, Lord, we wouldn't take for granted anything that you have given to us. But, God, we will realize today more than ever before what it means to be saved. In Jesus' name I pray. And all God's people said... Amen. Thank you. Be seated. Now, I've come to preach today. I hope you've come to listen. Now, if you get done before I do, <laughs> hang on. I'll catch up to you in a few minutes. All right? 
So I want to talk to you this morning about the privilege of being saved. I, I like the word salvation. It's a powerful, powerful word. Uh, it, it, we get it from the Greek word soterion. And it means to be snatched from potential destruction. It carries with it the connotation of being salvaged before destruction. Now, my daddy uh, was a used car salesman. He had his own lot, and uh, people would bring their junk in there and trade it to my daddy for a little bit better car than they had. Now, daddy would take their old cars, and he would put them up into the pasture behind our house, and he would sell salvage parts at astronomical amount of money. And then when he sold most of those parts off, he would take the carcass of the car and he would pile it up on the back of a truck and send it to the salvage yard. You understand, you and I have been salvaged. You and I have been rescued, and some, as a matter of fact, right in the very nick of time. So I want to talk to you just a minute. I want to pull out some privileges that we have of being salvaged. The first one that I want you to see with me is the privilege of forgiveness. Say the word forgiveness. The privilege of forgiveness. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7 says, In him, in Jesus, we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. Now, a lot of people think uh, that if you have that forgiveness, then it actually denies God's justice. But that's not true at all. For you see, one of the things that happened at Calvary was that the love of God met the justice of God in a beautiful manner there on the cross. Psalm 103 says, He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is the love for those, he says in, there in Psalm 103, for uh, those who fear him. Now listen to this. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. In Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 25, the Bible says, I, even I, who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and remembers your sins no more. Boy, here's a beautiful thought. When we get before the Lord and we're standing before God uh, one day, we're going to hear that very statement come right out of the mouth of God. You understand, I can stand in the presence of God because of the blood of Jesus Christ when I transferred my faith from myself and I placed my trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, I can hear God say, I blotted out your transgressions. I have removed your iniquities from you and I will never hold them against you ever again. Powerful truth. Micah chapter 7, here's one I really do love. I, I, I just, I could see it in my mind's eye. You will have compassion on us. You will tread our sins underfoot and hurl our iniquities in the deepest of the sea. Now, I've been on a lot of cruises, been on the ocean, kind of all over the world, and uh, I, I, I get a little mental image of this. I, well, I remember being in the Bahamas one time when a huge storm came up, and, and I thought it was just going to tear that boat apart, and, and they were telling us how deep that water was underneath that boat, and I got a real, real image of that. But, but I did a little bit of research, and I discovered the deepest part of the ocean is in the western Pacific, not far from where these 20 people live. And in that western Pacific, uh, there's a stretch there. There's a chasm in the ocean floor uh, that is over seven miles deep. Now think about that. You could take Mount Everest, put it down in that chasm, 
And from the surface of the water to the top of Mount Everest, it would still be a mile and a quarter before you could ever get to the pinnacle of Mount Everest. And the Bible says that God has taken our iniquities, he's taken our sins, and he's hurled them into the deepest of the oceans. Uh, when I was minister of music for about five years down in South Carolina. Matter of fact, I believe we sang this song. I believe Brother Sammy led us in this song over in the Sossaman Chapel many years ago. And it said, gone, gone, gone. Yes, my sins are gone. Now my soul is free and my heart's a song. Buried in the deepest sea. Yes, that's good enough for me. Praise God, I will live eternally. <laughs> he buries our sin. Now what does that really mean? It means that when we come to faith in Jesus, the very first privilege of our salvation, of my salvation, is the forgiveness of our sin, the elimination of our shame and our guilt that has been blotted out. Now here's the even good part. I mean it gets gooder and gooder as you go along. It literally means, too, that I have forgiveness not only of my past sins, I have forgiveness of my daily sins. The Bible tells me if I confess my sins, God is faithful and just to forgive me of my sin and to purify me and to cleanse me of all my sin. Now, that doesn't give me a, right, that doesn't give me a license to sin, I can just go out and sin anytime I want to because I'm going to receive God's forgiveness. That's not what it means at all. But what it does mean is the very moment that you do something that you ought not to do, say something that you ought not to say, go somewhere you ought not to go, watch something you ought not to watch, and the Holy Spirit of God convicts you of that sin, you then confess it, and by the grace of God, in a milli, milli, milli second, He forgives you of that immediately we've been forgiven thank God today for forgiveness where would we be today without the forgiveness of God should I have it no do I deserve it no would I give it to you no not at all but the split second that you sin God forgives when you repent and ask him to now let me give you number two it's what I call the privilege of freedom. The privilege of freedom. Romans chapter 8 verse 1 says, There is there now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. That's music to your ears. There's no mortgage. There's no lien. There's no condemnation to me. Because I'm in Christ Jesus. Now listen to this. Hear my heart a minute. That's only music to your ears if you realize that before Christ, B.C., before your salvation, that you were under condemnation. That you were, by, by the way, let me just say this. I, I don't mean to be ugly or mean, but, but you can't be saved until you know that you're a sinner. Do you recognize and acknowledge that you have sinned and come short of the glory of God? So before Christ, the Bible says that you were under a curse. Uh, the Bible says in Galatians 3.10, all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. The Bible says cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the law. Oftentimes when I'm talking to somebody about the Lord Jesus and I'm talking to them about their salvation and uh, they, they, they will say to answer the question when I say to them, you, you know, um, do you think you're going to go to heaven when you die? And why do you think you're going to go in there? And they would come back with the response, well, basically, uh, I'm a good person. And it's about that time that I'm going to pull out the scriptures of Exodus chapter 20. And I'm going to say, okay, have you kept the law of God? And we'll go through the Ten Commandments. Have you kept perfectly the law of God? Have you kept perfectly the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you broken any of these laws? Now, one of the hard pills to swallow is to come to grips with the fact that you, when you have just broken one of those commandments, when you've just disobeyed one of those teachings, then the Bible says that you are guilty of them all. 
that you're under a curse. And I, I say, now listen, you're under a curse for two reasons. One is you are born under that curse. And number two is that you've personally broken the law of God. And, and so that curse and that condemnation lies upon you. Now, here's the deal. This is an unverifiable story that I'm going to share with you. I, I've looked and I can't find a denial of it. I can't find the validity of it. But it's a good story. And it's about the Dalton gang. Y'all ever watch those old westerns? Oh, one of, one of the first gangs that I ever, was the younger, you know, the younger gang and then the wild bunch. And, and then there's the Dalton gang. It was four brothers. Two of them were mean and two of them were meaner. They were bank robbers and they were murderers. They robbed banks all over Kansas and Oklahoma. The younger brother was locked up in jail in a county in Texas. And uh, he was tried, convicted, and was sentenced to hang because of murder and bank robbery. Now the oldest brother found out about his youngest brother. And he hightailed it down to Texas as fast as he could get there and got there prior to the execution. He goes to the sheriff and he says, Sheriff, I understand that it's on the book of law that somebody can stand in the gap for another. And uh, so, so the sheriff was uncertain about it and he looked it up and sure enough in the statutes of that county it was possible for another to die for someone else. And the older brother said, I want to stand in the place of my young brother. Now the young brother couldn't get over that kind of love. He couldn't fathom the depth of that kind of love. When he saw his brother hang for him, uh, legend has it that he went out from that place in Texas and he never committed another crime and lived to be a model citizen because he could not come to grips with that love. Do you know that when Jesus Christ was suspended between heaven and earth, the moment that he died is the moment that he set us free. That, that, that's a powerful presentation. I don't know about you, but I'm glad to be set free. I'm glad to be free. I am free from the bondage of sin. I am free from the penalty of sin. I am free from the guilt of sin. And one of these days, I'm going to be free from the presence of sin because Jesus took my place uh, on Calvary. Now, let me give you the third. You ready for this? It's the privilege of formation. Christ being formed in us forming us into something else. Now, this is one of the privileges of being saved. Uh, I, I'm, when you see me today, uh, understand I'm not what I'm going to be. Thank God I'm not like I used to be. Uh, but, but you ain't seen nothing yet. You just wait until you see what I am going to be. You, you, you see, all of the change... In my life, and, and thank God you just have no clue who your pastor was before he got saved. My, my life changed. You would not believe the radical difference Jesus made in my life instantly. But that change is not over. That was just the initial part of the change. I, I used to love to sing that old song, What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought. Y'all remember that old song? You remember what brought it about? Since Jesus came into my heart. <laughs> I, I, I love that. You, you understand, we, we are changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye from a sinner to a saint. We're changed from bondage to freedom. We are changed from darkness to light. We are changed in our direction from hell to heaven. And one of the things that I love about this church, and I, I've, I've, I thought about it, while I was gone, I think about it every week. There's hardly a day goes by that I don't think about. One of the great things that I love about First Baptist Indian Trail is that we're all about life change. Now the world out there, man, they're looking and scratching and searching for something 
that can change them. They're looking on the inside. They're looking from the outside. They're trying to figure out how things can change. It's a tragic thing. Now, if you go to the Holy Land with me in next May, and I hope some of you will, uh, we will most likely, I haven't seen the route yet, but most likely we will drive through the land of Gadara. Do y'all remember who used to live in Gadara? It was the Gadarean demoniac. He was filled with demons. He couldn't be harnessed. He couldn't be shackled. The people were scared to death of him. He lived in the cemetery, wild as he could be, until Jesus passed by. And Jesus did a work in his heart. When the townspeople came to see what that was, they found him sitting and clothed and in his right mind because of the change that Jesus had made in his heart and in his Life. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says that when you come to Jesus, you are a new creation. Behold, all things have become new. All things have passed away. In 2 Corinthians 3, 18, the Bible says we're being changed in the likeness of Jesus. You understand that that change starts the moment that you're saved and it never stops. I love what the Apostle Paul wrote uh, to the church down in Galatia when he says, I long to see you being formed into the image of Jesus. It is a daily process. You see, there is a great sense that we have a past and a present and a future salvation. We have been saved from sin's guilt. We are being saved from sin's power. And someday we will be saved from the presence of sin in this old sinful body and we're going to be given a glorified body. Won't that be wonderful? I'll have me some hair, man. It'll be good. Let me give you number four. It's the privilege of fortress. And I'm not going to talk a whole lot about this one because I'm going to devote a whole week to it. But this is really the capstone, if you will, of the message. There are many assets of being a Christian. Many assets of having Christ live in you. You understand, when we come to him, we're not buying into a new philosophy. We're not giving an assent, a mental assent to a new set of dogmas nor are we agreeing to a set of rules and regulations and teachings. What we do then is that we commit everything that we are to everything that we understand about Jesus. And we commit that to him. And the very moment that we commit that to Christ is the very moment that he imparts to us his personal presence in the person of the Holy Spirit of God. Take your Bible and look with me to John chapter 14. I want you to see verse 16, if you will. John chapter 14 and verse 16. Listen to what he says. John chapter 14, verse 16. And I pray the Father, he will give you another comforter that he may abide with you until next week. It's not what it says, is it? You understand when Jesus dispatched his presence to you, he did it forever. And and may I just say to you, you're stuck with him. You're stuck with Jesus forever. You, you, uh, uh, you, You can't get rid of him even if you tried. You can't intimidate him out of your life. You can't shame him out of your life. You can't quench him out of your life. Now, there's a lot of times you may want to because when you sin and when you mess up, his presence becomes an irritant to you until you get it confessed. I've had a lot of guys come up to me after they've been saved. Down through the years, they've come up and they said, you know what, preacher, since I've been saved, I can't enjoy sin anymore. There's a reason for that. It's the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit of God in your life. Watch verse 17. Yea, even the Spirit of truth, 
whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but you know him. How do you know him? He dwells in you. And he's in you. What a privilege that that is to have the Holy Spirit of God living in your heart and your life. You understand that the day that you get saved is the day that he becomes resident in your heart and your life and the more that you walk with him on a daily basis, there is the hope that one day he will not just be resident in your life, he will be president in your life. Do you, know, do you know what the gift of the Holy Spirit is? Listen to what, 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 what Peter said in, in Acts 2.38. He says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Hey, let me ask you a question. Y'all listening? Say amen. Act like you're glad to have me back, whether, whether you are or not. Just act like you are. Now, now listen, do you, you know what the gift of the Holy Spirit is? The Holy Spirit. It's himself. He is the gift. Uh, the, the, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 3.16 that you are God's temple and God's Spirit lives inside. How many of you, when you, uh, when, when you go to pray... While you're praying, how many of you, once in a while, or often, get distracted in your prayer? Let me, let me see your hand. Now, there's not even half the rest of you. Just You either don't pray or you're telling a lie, one of the two. Uh, we do get distracted when we pray. But you know what God said? He said that the Holy Spirit himself will go to God the Father on your behalf with groanings and utterings that you may not even understand. So he's praying for you. He ministers to us. That, that's, he, he comes alongside us to minister to us. He empowers us to witness. He imparts to us spiritual gifts that we are to plug in for the glory of God. And by the way, on your 8 to 15 cards, and I hope all of you still are, are, are praying through and, and working with those 8 to 15 cards, it's the Holy Spirit of God that will empower you to go from that card to be able to tell them about Jesus. He's an empower. All right, let me go on to number five. It's the privilege of fulfillment. I can't stay here long. Look at verse Peter 1. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and unto an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power under the coming of the salvation. Oh, now, now there's a strange term. Under the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. But what is he talking about? Well, you and I are living here in the partiality of salvation. One of these days when we get into heaven, we're going to understand the complete fulfillment of what salvation is. He talks about here an inheritance. Do you, you ever read that in the Bible, that term inheritance? Do you know what our inheritance is? Our inheritance is Jesus. <laughs> he is that. But, but right now, we're just getting a little bit of glimpse of what God has in store for us uh, over in glory. So I want to ask you a couple of questions and we're going to close. Are you basking in the privilege of your salvation today? Are you delighting in the joy of your salvation? In, in, in what are you trusting what are you trusting for your salvation today? Th that's a powerful question. You understand, I, I hear this all the time today, and it's a, really a, a point of controversy among Christendom, and we're hearing so much about it. If you have enough faith about the quantity of faith, let me just tell you, friend, there's no power in faith. The power is in the object of our faith. But what is the object of your faith? And if the object of your faith is uh, anything other than the Lord Jesus Christ, man, are you in trouble? 
You're in eternal trouble. There are too many people today that are trying to get into heaven by placing their faith in the wrong places. Your faith must be in Jesus Christ. Look at me as I close. How many of you have placed your faith in Jesus? Now, when you place your faith in Jesus, may I say to you, life changes for you immediately. When you encounter Christ, he will leave you different than before you encountered him. There's a change that occurs. I watched a man walk down the aisle of this church this morning. Life hasn't changed, but today God changed his life. Saved his soul. Where's your faith? You, you know one of the proofs? Look, look at me, look at me. Do you know one of the proofs of salvation is this? That there is an effervescence. There is an eternal joy of salvation that wells up within you, that springs up within you, that never goes away. It always is there. Do you have that joy? Do you have that peace? Do you have that assurance? Because you can go back to a moment in time when Jesus Christ became your Lord and your Savior and changed your life and you've never been the same since. Have you experienced God's changing power? If not, you can. And it can be right here and it can be right now. Would you stand with me right now as we pray together? Every head bowed, every eye closed. I give you my word, I'll not embarrass anybody or come to you in any way, but how many of you can go back to the place where you were when Jesus Christ became your Lord and Savior and your life has never been the same since? Would you hold your hand up good and high? Pastor, I remember where I was the day that Jesus Christ changed me and saved me. Thank you, hands are down. Those of you that could not raise your hand, you would say, Pastor, oh, I'd give anything for that joy. I'd give anything for that peace. I want my life to be different. I've tried everything in the world and nothing seems to work. I realize today that I need Jesus in my heart and in my life. Listen, if you're willing today to admit that you're a sinner in need of a Savior, God will save your soul. He'll change your life. You say, how, how can that happen? How, how can I experience that? Be willing today to transfer your faith and your trust over to Jesus. You say, I'd really like to know how to do that. I'd really like to tell you how. If you'd pray something like this with me, now you understand, please, that this prayer cannot save you. And you can't go to heaven on my prayer. But if you'll mean it with all of your heart, I, I tell you, I believe the word of God. And God's word says he will save your soul. Would you pray something like this with me? Heavenly Father, I believe that Jesus died on a cross for my sin. I believe that he rose from the dead on the third day. I know that I'm a sinner. My sin has separated me from you. Father, please forgive me of my sin. Today I willingly turn away from sin and I place my trust in you. With your help, I'll live for you the rest of my life. Thank you for hearing me pray. Thank you for forgiving my sin. Thank you for saving my soul. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fpcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.